reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 121, found on page 516 in the Pew Bible. I lift up my eyes to the hill. From where does my help come from? My help comes to the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forward and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Tonight's New Testament lesson reading is the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, found on page 1007 of the Pew Bible. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old receive their combination. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that was seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, God, Abel offered God an acceptable sacrifice in Cain, which was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that it rewards those who seek him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Tonight's gospel lesson is the book of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, the rise of the of the gospel. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must begin born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to them, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. For everyone who does eat wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Peace. There are no sermon notes tonight, sorry. Just going to get it done this week. Our text is gospel lesson. Right. Story of 
Nicodemus, one of the famous passages in the Bible. Let us begin in prayer. Now, O Lord, open our hearts and our lives to you. Let us live in your grace and your love. Let us rejoice in you and serve you. Lord God, to you be our glory and praise and honor. In Christ's name, amen. Flesh and spirit, light and darkness. These are the terms that Jesus used to describe the difference between Christians and non-Christians, those who follow him and those who don't. Flesh and spirit, light and darkness. And Jesus draws a line in the sand here. As Martin Luther said, there is such a wide gulf between these two, they cannot be bridged. Flesh and spirit have nothing at all in common. Man is either flesh or he is spirit. Now we're not talking about flesh and flesh and bones. We're talking about the attitude of our hearts, our sinful nature. Either we are in sin or we are not. Either we are walking with Christ or we are not. There is no in-between with God. God doesn't have an in-between. It either is or it isn't. And we are all born of the flesh. We're all born sinful. We have no choice in that. Nobody's had a choice in that since Adam and Eve, outside of Jesus. The reality is, is that since they sinned, none of us have the choice to be born pure and holy. We are born sinful. We are born deformed. We are born twisted in God's eyes. We are born dead. As the scripture states, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all have sinned. Romans 5. So we are born flesh. We are born deformed. We are born damned in God's eyes. Dead to him. But the wonderful message of the cross is that God did not leave us there. God did not leave us there. He did not leave us in the state of flesh. So Christ comes. Christ bore not a man's desire, but of God's will. Christ comes to take our sin, to bring us forgiveness, love, and eternal life. And so we have that great passage, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the message of us. Everything revolves around this cross, around Christ who came to save sinners, who God who came to do what we could not. God came to condemn sin. He came to condemn sin. That's what he came to do. And he did it by placing it on his son. In John 3.16, that famous passage, we see both the grace and the love and the unbelievable love of God and also the wrath of God and all its severity. The passage begins, for God so loved. That's the greatest news that any of us could ever hear. Here is the essence of life, the reason for life. God loves you. Now God doesn't love you like any person on earth. Because no matter how good your relationship be, wife, husband, mother, child, whatever, every love on this world is conditional. You can be bad enough to get them to stop loving you. You can turn them away from you enough times that they stop coming back. The truth is, is that every love, every person, is conditional love. And yet God's is not. God's love is complete, God's love is full, and God's love never fails, no matter our fault, no matter our sin, no matter our failures, God loves us. David put it this way in Psalm 27, even if my father and mother abandons me, the Lord cares for me. Even if everybody gives up on me, God loves me. Even if everybody turns me back, even if I'm hurt by the people who I love the most, God will never do that. We live because we're loved by God. We breathe because we are precious to the Creator. We can hope no matter what because we are treasured by the Almighty. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. For God so loved you. 
There are many things in this world we struggle with. Let's face it. We struggle with fears. We struggle with doubt. We struggle with self-acceptance. We struggle with guilt. We struggle with putting ourselves out. We struggle with finances. We struggle with this. There are things that we struggle with every day of our lives. But the one thing, the very one thing that we never have to struggle with is the question whether you are loved. Because on the cross, God's proof. On the cross, God showed you just how much you are loved. How valuable you are. We may get struggle with all kinds of things. And we will till we die. We never struggle with whether we're loved, whether we're cared for by God. For God so loved that he gave. Those three words, that he gave. In those words we see the wrath of God towards Satan and sin, towards evil in our lives. Those three words bring God's wrath out like a brilliant spotlight. God gave his only son. And let's talk about God gave. It doesn't mean God allowed Jesus to come down to earth. Father allowed his son to be born. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that Jesus lived a perfect life for us. It's not even talking about Jesus' physical death on the cross. The reality is, those words God gave means that God is giving his son to take the full measure, the full measure of his anger against sin.
again, we pick up from Luther. As we've said, there is no way of reconciling the two. Whatever is flesh remains flesh, and whatever is born in the spirit is spiritual. But what is spiritual birth? It means that I am born again as a new being by baptism and the Holy Spirit, and that I believe in Christ. In baptism. In baptism, we are born of the Spirit. We are made new. We are given a new birth. We have been to the grave, and we have come out. Now, you know, years ago, back 1800s and way back, way before that, they would literally put a bell on top of a grave and a rope down into the casket because they bury you so quick. You know, people would pass out who would, who would act like they're dead, and they would go ahead and bury them. And every now and then you'd hear that bell ringing, and they'd go dig them up real quick. How, that, that's truth. Now, can you imagine waking up six feet under the ground? I'd be ringing that bell like crazy, <laughs> man. I'd be ripping it off the thing. And I'll tell you what, once they dug me up and I got out of that casket, you would never get me in a hole in the ground again. You wouldn't get me in a cave. You wouldn't get me heck in the house I'm not even sure about. And yet, do you realize that's what we do? God has literally unburied us, lifted us out of the grave through our baptism, and we keep crawling back into it. We keep crawling back into it with the same sins and the same garbage and the same thing we're doing over the same angers, the same hatreds, the same lusts, the same pornography, the same uh, drugs, the same whatever it is over and over and over again. We just keep crawling back into it. God has said our flesh is dead. And the life we live now, we live by faith, as Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How do I live? What's my life to be like? My life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God. I live by what I cannot see. I can see you. You can see me. We can see what we do to each other. I can see the food I eat. I can see the bed I sleep in. But that's not what we live by. We live by what it's not seen. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. We live by faith. We live by the trust of this God who has given us new life. This God who has died for us and taken our sins. We live in the spirit of God because we've been made spirit by God. Is the judgment. With light, 
light has come to the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because of their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what, the, what is true comes to the light, so that it may be seen clearly, now notice this, that his works have been carried out by God. That it may be seen clearly that it's God who does this work in us. It's God who gives us strength. It's God who we live for. Darkness and light. Where are we? Christ has come for us. Christ has chosen us. Christ has redeemed us. But why do we choose the darkness? Why do we choose the unforgiveness, the anger, the pornography, the drug use, the living in this world? We're to walk in the light. That's what we are to do. That's what John, first John says. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness, we are light. There is no darkness for God. There is no darkness. You can't, you can't cut the middle. You can't want to live in both worlds. You can't try to keep a foot in the world and a foot in God's kingdom. You either try to stand one place or the other because God won't accept the middle. If we walk in the light, however, as He is in the light, then listen to the blessings of God. We have fellowship with one another. We have love for one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. We are whole, we are new, we are forgiven from all sin. So the question we're going to ask ourselves really as we deal with this is do I love the darkness more than the light? Or do I love the light more than the darkness? Do I want to live as flesh or do I want to live as spirit? I can't live as both. And again, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about the goal of our lives, the heart of our life. Do we live in darkness? Are we afraid? People might find out who we really are. Are we afraid that people may see the sins and the struggles and the garbage that we keep inside? We're living in darkness, folks. And we easily write off another person. And we're living in darkness. When you have a sin that's in your heart, in your life, and you know that you're doing it, and you continue to do it, you're living in darkness. And the judgment comes upon us. But when light takes over, when we live in the light of Christ, in this God who loves us, who God would pour out of the wrath of the Son so we would not experience it, then we know daily just how much we need Jesus. We understand what it means to say we are sinners and we are beggars. And we come to the cross every day. For there we find our strength. For there we find our hope. For there we find our focus. And when we sin, we can't wait to get rid of it. Yeah, we're going to sin, but I don't have to keep it. You know? Sometimes I think the thing sin is like a really ugly Christmas present given to you by a friend. Because you don't want to get rid of it because you might offend it. You ever been there? Well, what are we going to do with it? I don't know. Can we stick it down in the basement somewhere and we'll put it up when they come and take it down when, they, when they're gone? Well, we do that with sin, man. When well, God's here, bring it away. When God's not here, bring it back out. No, get rid of it. We get rid of it. We strive to get rid of the sin in our life. We have light over darkness when the love of God is what motivates. Our hunger for God's love is more than anything we can think of. It becomes a motivating force in our life. When we understand and take hold of those three words, for God so loved, it's actually four, for God so loved. When we take hold of those words and realize, maybe for the first time in our life, it's really true. I'm loved. No matter what else anyone says, no matter what the world does, no matter what I face, I'm loved. And Lent and the cross proves it. Amen. Now may the peace of God be passed with all of you, and keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus from this day forward.